This video was brought to you by Henson Shaving. You ever wonder why musicians generally don't do speed runs of their songs? You can find Guitar Hero playthroughs of Dragon Forces Through the Fire and the Flames on YouTube at 165% speed, but you can't find Dragon Force doing the same. Does Herman Lee just need to get good? There's plenty enough machismo among musicians, so you'd think that speedrun.com or an equivalent would have musical speed leaderboards. I mean, they have an entry for Guitar Hero Metallica, but no entry for, like, speedrunning Master of Puppets. Why might that be? Now, while it is rare, there are examples of bands who have done the equivalent of a 165% playthrough of their music. And they provide a fascinating psychological study on how our brains and bodies process the same music at different speeds. Consider this recording of the Mahavishnu Orchestra playing their tune, Vital Transformation. It's a fast and energetic 9-8 jazz fusion groove. Good stuff. Now check out the live version of the same tune. This was recorded at Woolman Rink in Central Park in 1973. The band is absolutely shredding a unison line in 9-8. I've been thinking a lot about this 165%ed recording, because my band Sungazer played Vital Transformation as our closing number on our month-long tour with Pliny and Jakub Zetetsky. The more we played it, the more we became aware of some of the unique limitations that musicians face when playing music this fast. Limitations that go a little bit beyond just how fast we can waggle our fingers, rather how fast our brains can process what's going on. Looking back at the footage of how audiences across the United States and Canada moved to this music, we found some interesting patterns that illuminate what is possible when it comes to sound and movement. So let's get into it, shall we? Let's get fast. Vital Transformation. Yes, Sean, I know you want to take your drum solo really, really bad right now. I hope you guys enjoy Vital Transformation! Part one, brain and body. The hot trend in music neuroscience is embodied cognition. This theory claims that the way that we process music is not solely through our brain, but our entire body. That our sense of rhythm comes from things like our heartbeat, our walking tempo, our breathing. In this view, cognition depends upon experience based in having a body with sensor motor capacities. These capacities are embedded in an encompassing biological, psychological, and cultural context. This idea is not particularly new. In 15th and 16th century Europe, tactus, or musical pulse, was defined by things like the rate of the pulse of a healthy human heart, or the rate of a moderate walking speed, or the time it takes a weed whacker to whack weeds. There is now a wealth of scientific evidence that suggests beat processing in the brain occurs in places like the basal ganglia and the premotor cortex, places in the brain which control limb movement and motion. Beat perception occurs as if your body is in motion. Those areas in the brain are active, even if you're just sitting there grooving to tunes. The vestibular system, the system that governs balance, is essential in how we process meter and understand where the downbeat is in music. When Bootsy Collins tells you to put it on the one, Dude, and you hit on the one, one, he is appealing to your vestibular system. The easiest way to wrap your head around some of this stuff, or at least it is for me, is to define different time scales of musical rhythm and then relate them to something that your body naturally does. This is a good way of intuiting rhythm just in general. The first is musical phrase, how long a melody generally lasts. This is the amount of time it takes you to hear a collection of notes as being a full melody. This corresponds roughly to the amount of time it takes to breathe in and out. You can hear fast melodies as melodies, but it's like breathing faster. And if you breathe in and out too fast, you hyperventilate. The second time scale is beat or pulse regular moments in time that make our butts want to move. This is the thing that we entrain to when we dance. This has a direct correlate to our comfortable walking speed. In other words, how fast it feels natural to move our lower limbs back and forth. So yes, in the script, I apparently defined what walking is. So in case you don't know what walking is, it's when you move your lower limbs back and forth. The more you know. The third and final time scale is subdivision of the beat or individual notes. This has a direct correlate to digital motion, how fast we can waggle our fingers. You can think of it like how fast you can comfortably type on a keyboard. Subdivisions of the beat, i.e. individual notes, are not directly timed, 
but are produced by overlearned motor procedures. So you're not thinking individual letters as you type, you think words. You think a word and your fingers move like this. You think a scale and your fingers move like this. The visceral sense of time and movement that beat perception engenders may be due to the strong links between rhythm perception and motor behavior. The tactus rate is the time frame that best affords our own rate of motion. To put it more plainly, to hear a beat is to sense the potential for motion. These musical time-body relationships are often expressed in a very literal way in how we play our instruments. The lengths of melodies are often constrained by how long we can sing or play a wind instrument before needing to breathe again. Pulse is often kept in the lower body through things like tapping your toes or playing the kick drum, for example. Our fingers are the things that need to move to be able to produce notes. Our sense of musical time at every level is deeply tied to how our bodies move when they play instruments, and this is the case for listeners of music as well, not just performers. Although we may not be directly involved in the production of movement trajectories, listening in part entails recovering movement information from the musical surface. The logical conclusion of this, which is kind of wild to think about, is that music is a sonic record of motion through space. You're hearing dance. It's not really what we think of as music, but that's how our brains think of music. So if something sounds absurdly fast, it's because your brain is having trouble recovering the movement information from the sound. This can manifest at different time scales. Let's take pulse for example. If you set a metronome to 60 beats per minute, a fairly slow musical tempo, and you try and walk at 60 beats per minute, you'll find that it feels pretty damn slow to walk at 60 BPM. Set that metronome now to 180 beats per minute, a fairly fast musical tempo, and it feels fast to walk at 180 beats per minute. Now try setting the tempo higher and higher, and see what happens to the weight distribution in your lower body when you try to walk to it. You notice that at a certain point your strides need to be shorter, and you end up covering less distance. You physically cannot move your legs far and fast enough to keep covering more and more distance. Usain Bolt ran his world record breaking 100 meter dash in 9.8 seconds. In his attempt, he took a little bit more than 4 strides per second, or 240 beats per minute. You can have faster music than 240 beats per minute, but there is a reason why there is not much dance music that's faster than that. Dancers need to recover that movement information for their legs and their butts. If your brain can't imagine your legs or Usain Bolt's legs moving that fast, it has trouble processing the pulse. In his 1984 work, Rhythm, the psychologist Thaddeus Bolton investigated how our brains process note rates, or subdivisions of pulses, like how we'll naturally group the sounds of, say, a locomotive starting up into groupings of four pulses. In other words, how many chuggas should go before the choo-choo? Very important scientific work here. Our brain's tendency to group notes together and assign an on-beat and an off-beat to a series of notes which are otherwise undifferentiated is called subjective rhythmization. If we speed up note rates too fast, it's hard to meaningfully group them into on and off anymore. We just end up hearing kind of a buzzing. There's no rhythmic value to what it is that we hear. Our boy Thaddeus designed some tests to figure out when exactly this happened and came up with a figure of about 115 milliseconds between sounds as the point where we stopped doing this on-off grouping. Since then, many researchers have cited a 100 millisecond threshold as the fastest meaningful subdivision. We physically can play faster than this. The world record holder for single stroke drumming, Tom Grosset, clocked in at 1,208 strokes in a minute, averaging almost 20 notes per second, or an inter-onset interval of 50 milliseconds. Musical motion is, first and foremost, audible human motion. So one thought that I had with all this stuff is that any attempt at human augmentation through like cybernetics or any change to our physiology, the neural link or whatever to our brain, uh, might also affect our musical perception because our body and our motor system is so central to how we perceive music. Uh, any change to our motor system will change our musical perception. So maybe if you get this augmentation, slow music will be intolerably slow to you now because it will be so slow for your fast moving brain that uh, you just won't even hear the music as being music. Anyway, 
uh, back to the video. Let's talk about microrhythm. But there's a category of musical time that we haven't mentioned yet, and it's also very important to this discussion. That is the microrhythmic time scale. Microrhythm is the subtle variations in timing that human musicians use to make music feel human. Huh. Human music. I like it. Because it's so subtle, it's almost never notated, and is instead assumed to be part of the musical and cultural training of musicians who play in a given style. There is a lot of interest in microrhythm right now because of the unique time feels and grooves of various styles from around the world. Go check out David Bruce's and Sean Crowder's videos on microrhythm. But really, every genre of music has microrhythmic variation. The microrhythmic time scale corresponds with phoneme production in the body, or how fast sounds are able to come out of our mouths as we communicate. The thinking goes is that our ears are very well attuned to subtle shifts in phonemes to communicate different emotions, different stresses, and different words. And so they are also attuned to microrhythmic variation, the different feelings that different microrhythms might give you. So if the note rate approaches this microrhythmic time scale, we cease to hear the microrhythmic variations, this thing which gives such a nuanced emotional human vitality to music. You end up playing so fast that you obliterate the microrhythmic level, making the music feel kind of weird and lifeless. So let me show you how this microrhythmic variation thing works with a drum and bass groove. I pushed and pulled some of the program drums back about 20 milliseconds or so, and then I played the bass trying to match the general feel, like not consciously thinking, hey, I need to move my bass like 20 milliseconds back, but rather consciously focusing on the musical feeling and then trying to replicate that feeling, if that makes any sense. Now let's listen to the same groove, except I have gone back and completely quantized the bass and completely quantized the drums. there's a difference in feeling between these two grooves, right? You might prefer the quantized version more, that's totally cool, but chances are you can at least hear the difference. Now here are the grooves sped up. I don't know about you, but I can no longer differentiate between them. The nuance is lost because the time scales have been proportionately shrunk and I can't hear the microrhythmic variation anymore. Musical speed kills microrhythm. Slow down. So to recap here, we hear with our bodies. If our premotor cortex can't process the audible motion fast enough, the musical dance fast enough, it ends up being noise. Herman Lee does not need to get good. He just has the sense to make music that sounds good and isn't absurdly fast, just musically fast. With all of this in mind, let's ask a more specific question here today, and honestly the thing that made me inspired to make this video. Does the recording of the Mahavishnu Orchestra, the one of them playing Vital Transformation blazingly fast, sound good? Part two, Vital Transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, the Mahavishnu Orchestra. The Mahavishnu Orchestra was one of the giants of the jazz fusion world of the 1970s. They blended the high volume and intensity of rock music with the virtuosic improvisation of jazz and melodic and rhythmic wizardry of Indian Hindustani music. Led by the guitarist John McLaughlin, the Mahavishnu Orchestra also featured Rick Laird on bass, Jan Hammer on keys, Jerry Goodman on violin, and the incredible Billy Cobham on drums. So let's take a close look at how their tuned vital transformation works and what happens when you play it really fast. The A section is built from a repeated 9-8 F-sharp minor pentatonic riff, and it sounds like this. Now it would take a long time to fully explore all of the different ways that you would feel this music, feel this 9-8 groove, and so that's exactly what we're going to do. One of the traditional ways of approaching 9-8 that's found in classical music, as well as Irish dances like the slip jig, breaks the measure into three pulses of three eighth notes. This is how the B section of Vital Transformation is organized after the A section riff. The melody is dotted quarter notes and there are three pulses per bar.
The fast A section though doesn't work that way. You could brute force your way into feeling it in threes like this. But of course that doesn't work because meter is more complicated than just counting to a number. There has to be a meaningful relationship to musical cues like melodic accent and rhythmic accent. And that's what determines how you move to the music, not just how you count to it. Probably a more typical way that you might feel this 9-8 is like a measure of 4-4, four, four, but then there's this extra eighth note left over, a runt fifth pulse, kind of like a record skip effect. Check it out. It's kind of difficult for me to feel it this way in practice because the last four sixteenth notes of the riff are hammer-ons and I'm accenting the first and the third of those. So it kind of feels like it belongs to the same motion, the same overlearned motor procedure. How your fingers waggle will influence how you hear the accent. So it's hard for me to feel the record skip in a way that breaks up my finger movement. So instead, I tend to hear that extra eighth note snuck in between the third and the fourth beat, making it feel kind of like this. This interpretation can feel a little awkward because the third beat has a 16th note syncopation snuck in there on the uh of two. The riff doesn't hit on the third beat, it anticipates it, which is left a little off kilter because of the little extra eighth note that's tacked on at the end of the third beat. So the riff has a syncopation and a record skip right next to one another in the third beat. An alternative interpretation would be felt in 1816, where instead of the basic subdivision being an eighth note, it's a 16th note with a faster implied pulse. Following the accents, this would give you a group of seven 16th notes, another group of seven 16th notes, and then a group of four 16th notes, adding up to nine eighth notes, nine eight. These 16th notes can be further subdivided into two plus two plus three, two plus two plus three, two plus two, or if math isn't your bag, short, short, long, short, short, long, short, short, like this. This sounds complicated, but honestly, once you get the sound of the rhythm in your body, you're not really thinking. You're just following the steps of the dance in order. Muscle memory takes over. Now, I'm a notorious lover and soy jack pointer outer of Balkan music. Vital transformation is not Balkan music, but the kinds of grooves where you're mixing and matching long and short beats, daka 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 da, are super common over there. Another word for this kind of rhythm is aksak rhythm, which means limping in Turkish. Now there are a ton of dances that are built out of these longs and shorts, which kind of look like graceful limping. In Western notation, they're conventionally written in odd meters, like 716 or 1116 or the equivalent, but the dance is the main deal here. Now, there are several problems with the aksak interpretation to the rhythm of vital transformation. The first is that at fast speeds, you're clapping so fast that I'm not even sure you'd even be feeling it like this. The aksak rhythm is meant for dancing. I'm not sure if that interpretation makes sense. The second problem here is that in this interpretation, the notes C sharp and A are placed on the beat in this pattern of shorts and longs. And to me, those notes in the riff don't feel like they're on the beat. They feel like they're syncopations. They have this offbeat vibe to them. It's hard to explain exactly why I feel this way, but I think it's partly because I've played a lot of funk pentatonic bass lines and beat three in measures of four, four in funk music is often syncopated, like in the B section of the meters sissy strut, for example. Or in Jocko's bass line to the classic funk tune, the chicken. Beat three in funk music, especially funk bass lines, is a prime place for 16th note syncopation. So that's where my brain naturally gravitates when I hear this kind of rhythm in this context. The bass line is such a pentatonic. Uh, it sounds like a funk song. 
The musical vocabulary of the Mahavishnu Orchestra comes from multiple traditions, so it's hard to say what the traditional hearing of this pattern might be. But suffice to say, your musical vocabulary will deeply influence how you hear a particular beat, where you hear beat one, and how you might dance to a particular groove. So we have multiple interpretations to choose from, like three even pulses of three eighth notes apiece. We have four four with an extra eighth note either placed at the end or in the middle to give a record skip effect. And then we have this 1816 ox sock pattern of shorts and longs. Which one of these patterns would the audiences choose when they listen to this music? Well, as we found out, tour audiences were very excited to move to the music, but there didn't seem to be a huge consensus on how. There seems to be a lot of nodding roughly where the quarter note would be, but since 9-8 is an odd meter, quarter notes don't line up with the following measures, so often there was this record skip effect going on. This is not meant as a dig on our audiences at all, because this is exactly what I ended up doing as well a similar sort of nod, vaguely approximating where the downbeats were, and then adjusting my body so the downbeats at the beginning of measures were the biggest points of arrival. However, when the tempo began to get faster and faster, I remember I had to still myself to be able to play, like stand as still as possible. Playing this music at the faster tempos, especially if I already had that aksak pattern in my ear, really did feel like walking too quickly and stumbling over myself. The patterns of the rhythms in this music compel my body to move, but I'm not Usain Bolt. So there's a bit of a conflict here. There were in fact a lot of issues that came up when we started to approach an embodied musical speed limit. The fastness does kind of like just, it's like a bit of a blanket over like the details to me. A lot of the nuances get lost at this speed. Those micro-rhythmic nuances that would give color and emotion and groove to the music are simply lost in a flurry of notes. I think one of the most challenging aspects about this tune in the way that we play it is playing on a modern drum set that sounds the way that it does. Mm -hmm. Uh, and trying to play this like 70s thing that was not meant to have these separated kick and snare hits, but the kick has a ton of click and attack. Yeah. In Billy Cobham's drum groove, the kick drum and the open hi-hat accent don't match the riff, for example. It creates a rhythmic flam, where one instrument anticipates the beat and another instrument does not. This isn't as much of an issue on the original recording since the kick drum is a bit of a softer texture, but it became an issue for us when we tried to lock in. You know, you're, you're saying the drums don't line up with what you're playing, and that's correct, but when, it, when it's on a 1970s bass drum where it's like, it's like a very soft attack, you don't really notice it. Whereas with our stuff, you really do. There's definitely a speed limit with the drums to where it stops being fun to play. Which brings up an important question that we had to grapple with over the course of this tour. Why bother doing this at all? If the speed becomes the main priority, then the only thing I'm thinking about is, I gotta keep up. Yeah. And then all my ideas are just about, well, I gotta keep up. By playing faster and faster every night, we weren't grooving as hard, we weren't as expressive with our musical ideas. Was it even worth it? Well, like George Michael's cousin, maybe? Part three, the aesthetics of fast things. Early YouTube was awash in guitar covers of Flight of the Bumblebee. You typically had a guitarist, a clock for proof, and somebody relentlessly shredding at some absurd BPM. Flight of the Bumblebee was originally written as incidental music for the Russian composer Rimsky-Korsakov's opera, The Tale of Tsar Sultan. It's a tone poem depicting a, well, bumblebee in flight. A fast chromatic 16th note melody does a good job of evoking the buzzing sound of a bumblebee in motion. Although we may not be directly involved in the production of movement trajectories, listening in part entails recovering movement information from the musical surface. The point of the speed of the piece is to evoke a very specific image, but these guitar covers on YouTube did very little to evoke a delicate little insect in flight, at least to me anyway. Instead, it seemed to be about who could shred the fastest. These were almost all digitally faked, in case you couldn't tell. 
Somebody who doesn't fake his videos is Tosin Abasi, one of the prog metal guitar shredders behind Animals as Leaders, alongside Javier Reyes. I'm a huge fan of Abasi's work, but some of my favorite music of his actually comes from a side project called Tram that was released in 2012 with Javier Reyes and Eric Moore of Suicidal Tendencies alongside Adrian Terrazas of the Mars Volta. I've always been super enamored with the outro to their tune, Endeavor. It comes after the typical groovy, eight-string arpeggiated guitar assault that you'd typically expect from Abbasi and company. But on the recording, he plays these arpeggios on acoustic guitar, and it's a little rough around the edges. Acoustic guitar isn't very forgiving for this kind of texture, but I don't know, it, it sounds cool. I, I like the rawness. If you were to play it slower and cleaner, it probably wouldn't sound as cool. You wouldn't be able to hear the sweat, the struggle of the human musician playing it. And so because of it, it feels very human. You know, we're told that grooves are supposed to feel good. I studied in graduate school at the Manhattan School of Music with Dave Liebman, who, on the subject of a student mentioning how a good rhythm section locking in felt, gave kind of an odd dismissal what is this feeling good bullshit, he said. John Coltrane didn't write a Love Supreme because it felt good. I can't imagine Tosin feeling good as he's shredding through these arpeggios. If musical motion is first and foremost audible human motion, I feel the stress here. I don't hear feeling good in the music, which, you know, I... I don't always feel good. It's nice to hear how I feel sometimes. There is a fantastic episode of the podcast Song Exploder where the great Yo-Yo Ma reflects on how he recorded the Bach cello suite several times over in the course of his career. He talks about how you can hear what somebody values in the world and what they want to put out into the world based on how they play music the musical choices that they make, the kinds of dynamics that they use, the kinds of sounds that they use, the tempos they use. How somebody might play Flight of the Bumblebee can give a pretty good insight into what they value in life and what they think the value of music is and the value to be heard in music. So you get someone's priorities when you listen. You always get someone's priorities. If you know what, you know, the instrument, it is really wonderful to be able to say, oh, okay, this person cares about this, cares less about that, and you get someone's value system. It's interesting to hear the same artists record the same music at different points in their career because you hear their value system change with what they might bring to different choices in phrasing, articulation, instrumentation, tempo, etc. You can kind of hear this change with the Mahavishnu Orchestra, the album version of Vital Transformation feels pretty good to me. The band is locked and grooving, and it's significantly slower than the live version. But I definitely don't hear the desire to feel good in the live version from Central Park. You hear them struggling a little bit, and I guess it's an intentional struggle taking place at an unrealistically fast tempo. You hear the value set changing. The Brecker brothers have a tune called Some Skunk Funk that went through a similar transformation from going from a feeling good 70s jazz funk track to an absolutely over the top live version. There's a Facebook post from the keyboardist George Witte that explains how this transformation happened. What was happening on this tour is that Mike was playing a little game with Dennis, kind of questioning his manhood about the tempo on this tune. After the set, Dennis would look at Mike and Mike would say, well, I suppose that's fast enough. I'm sure you're doing your best. I appreciate the effort, Dennis. You're doing a very workmanlike job of it, and so forth. And Dennis would just smile his little smile, and the next night it would be 10 BPM faster. And it was really kind of a race to see who'd cap out faster. Dennis with his ferocious chops, or Mike with his. When you push yourselves and your compatriots to play faster, are you just engaged in some pointless machismo? Is this a whiplash kind of thing? Don't slow down. Faster! Faster! I mean, maybe, honestly, but I do think that there is something different between young guitarists flailing through Flight of the Bumblebee at a million BPM and 
Michael Brecker and John McLaughlin improvising at breakneck speeds. One seems like it's an attempt to feel good and cool and accepted by people, and another seems like it might be coming from a deeper place. The Mahavishnu Orchestra was really into using music as a vehicle for spiritual exploration, a means of achieving the divine through music, transcendence and all of that. I mean, it was the 1970s, this is what you did. It would honestly be a little bit weirder if you didn't. The liner notes to their debut album were written by John McLaughlin's guru, Sri Chinmoy. It consisted only of a poem entitled Aspiration, which might as well have been a mission statement for the band. Aspiration, in its simplest definition, is a lovely flame climbing heavenward. True aspiration can and does make us feel that if God is for us, who can eventually stand against us? We feel a desire to have God on our side, but we need the aspiration to throw ourselves on God's side. The Mahavishnu Orchestra threw themselves at the music with this intense aspirational energy that you can really hear in their live recordings. You really hear when the Mahavishnu Orchestra shreds, they're, they're going for something, which led me to make this video in the first place to ask some of these questions. Is there a virtue that can only be attained through the performance of fast music? Is there a virtue in doing hard things for the sake of difficulty when the easier thing would simply be better? If musical cognition is based on our body and how our bodies interact with the world and understand it, if you free yourself from the constraints of your body and you become transcendent, are you, are you able to do anything musically? Like, are there musical limitations anymore? Could you shred yourself to godhood? That is the eponymous vital transformation. Finding beauty in the struggle to go beyond your corporeal form and break the musical speed limit. For me, jazz is a way of liberation. It can be. But then you ask yourself, liberation from what? For me, the answer is to be free from myself. I, I want to lose myself completely. Now I, for one, embrace my body, my corporeal form, because it makes me feel more human, it makes me feel more like myself. And this is despite all of its limitations, like, for example, needing to shave. Let me tell you about this thing, a safety razor. Now, I used to use those five-bladed cartridge razors, but they were extremely expensive in the long run. Like, I was spending $100 to $150 a year just to keep myself looking nice and trim and pretty for the camera, which was not the most sustainable way of going about things, both for my budget and the environment. Enter the Safety Razor, this thing from Henson Shaving, today's sponsor. Now, the main advantage of safety razors is that you could potentially get a much closer shave, as well as it's a lot cheaper in the long run. There's only one blade and no plastic involved, so these kinds of blades are a lot easier to manufacture. They're also very sharp, so don't touch the sides. The traditional disadvantage of safety razors is that they're not very user-friendly. It takes quite a bit of finesse to get the blade situated exactly right on the razor so that you don't hurt yourself or so that there's no irritation. The difference, however, with this thing, the Henson AL13 safety razor, is that it is very precisely machined. These things are made in an aerospace machining shop in Canada, which converted to make razors during the pandemic. Because of their machining knowledge and their equipment, they have made parts for the International Space Station, for example. Henson razors are designed and manufactured with a very fine degree of tolerance. They got it so that once you put together the whole assembly with the blade and the razor, the blade extends past the shave plane, the angle at which you shave, by only 0 .0013 inches. So it's very, very finely tuned. This thing is very user-friendly. I am not a shave expert by any means, but I've used this for about five months now and I've never once nicked myself or experienced any irritation this thing is awesome. If you'd like to invest in a really nice safety razor like the Henson AL13, you can go to hensonshaving.com, pick out which one you like out of a variety of different colors. And when you use the promo code Adam Neely at checkout, you'll also get a hundred of these stainless steel double-edge replacement blades for free. Just remember to add both your razor and your blades to the shopping cart before applying your promo code Adam Neely for your free blades, which will last you basically forever. You'll be set for like years, not constantly having to buy those cartridges. Just a quality razor with quality blades. Please.